covenant. Man does not make covenants with God. God offers a covenant, and people either accept or reject God's offer. But until God offers, mankind can do nothing to create a covenant with or for God. The Book of Mormon is intended by God to be a covenant. In it there are examples of covenant-making provided so man can understand the process. The covenant offered through the Book of Mormon has never been received by any people until the Boise Conference in 2017. When the 1835 Conference adopted scriptures, they adopted only the Doctrine and Covenants and not the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon, as an offered covenant to the Gentiles, is an essential step required for the Gentiles to become numbered with the remnant and obtain the right to inherit the Promised Land. If it is not received as a covenant by the Gentiles, they have no right to be here on this land or on any other land of promise. Paragraph 9 of Lecture 6 says, And in the last days, before the Lord comes, He is to gather together His saints who have made a covenant with Him by sacrifice. This event will be in the last days but still before His second coming. The wording is important. A covenant will be made by sacrifice, not a covenant to sacrifice. Only through actually sacrificing is it possible to obtain a covenant with the Lord. To know the Lord is to have a covenant with Him. The way in which one accepts the covenants is set out by Joseph Smith, there is a law, irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundations of this world, upon which all blessings are predicated. And when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. Therefore, it is important to understand and learn what the relevant law requires. The way in which man accepts the covenant offered to him is by learning the principle or the law upon which the blessing he seeks is predicated. Then having learned what the law ordains, he follows through by obeying it. God can offer you something, but it's up to you to accept it. You accept it by what you do. It's not enough to say, Yea Lord, I'll go out and do as I'm bidden. Instead you must actually do it. Because it is only through doing that the covenant is kept by you. It is only through doing the covenant is able to be empowered sufficiently to give you the blessing which a law has been established to allow you to lay a hold. You can't get there without God offering you the covenant and you accepting God's invitation. God only works to bring people into His good graces by covenants. They have to be made. Without covenants you cannot participate in what the Lord sets out. Covenant Everlasting The covenant established by the Lord with Adam. It was renewed with each of the fathers and reintroduced to Abraham for his posterity after an apostasy. It has again been renewed in the last days as an integral part of the Latter-day Restoration that began with Joseph Smith. Joseph's work was intended to bring back the very religion of the first man. This was to be more than merely a church. This is a new and an everlasting covenant, even that which was from the beginning, Joseph Smith History Part 18, Paragraph 8. The new and everlasting covenant in our day is new only as a consequence of it having been restored to our attention recently. What is going to happen in our day was predicted and promised as a consequence of Adam. Modern revelation tells us, and for this cause, that men might be made partakers of the glories which were to be revealed, the Lord sent forth the fullness of His gospel and His everlasting covenant, reasoning in plainness and simplicity to prepare the weak for those things which are coming upon the earth, TNC 58, paragraph 7. Blessed are you for receiving my everlasting covenant, even the fullness of my gospel sent forth unto the children of men, that they might have life and be made partakers of the glories which are to be revealed in the last days as it was written by the prophets and apostles in days of old, TNC 52, paragraph 1. The Lord affirms that the everlasting covenant is the means by which His people are gathered. The fullness of my gospel which I have sent forth in these last days, is the covenant which I have sent forth to recover my people which are of the house of Israel, TNC 23, paragraph 3. And even so, I have sent my everlasting covenant unto the world, to be a light to the world and to be a standard for my people, and for the Gentiles to seek to it, and to be a messenger before my face to prepare the way before me, TNC 31, paragraph 3. Joseph Smith also referred to the sealing authority in connection with the second coming of Christ and the everlasting covenant, for destroying angels holding power over the four quarters of the earth until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads which signifies sealing the blessing upon their heads, 
meaning the everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election sure. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 321 The everlasting covenant to bring Zion that was originally promised to Adam and later to Enoch was made again by God with Noah. The covenant requires some generation at the end to rise up and vindicate it. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant which I made unto your father Enoch, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth, the city of Enoch which I have caught up unto myself. And this is my everlasting covenant that I establish with you, that when your posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness and the earth shall tremble with joy. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is my everlasting covenant which I made with your father Enoch, Genesis 5, paragraph 22. As of September 3, 2017, a covenant to reconnect again as a people with the Lord and the fathers has been offered again to mankind, see TNC sections 156, 157, and 158. Eventually a temple will be built in which the remaining steps to fully recover the original religion will occur. Cry unto the Lord There is a difference between praying and crying to God. A petitioner who cries comprehends his desperate and lowly position. It is used eleven times in the Ether chapters to describe the brother of Jared. Amulek's sermon to the Zoramites advises them eight times to cry unto God, see Alma 16, paragraph 35. In these examples the petitions to God are not called prayer, but are called crying to Him. Yea, and when you do not cry unto the Lord, let your hearts be full, drawn out in prayer unto Him continually for your welfare, and also for the welfare of those who are around you, Alma 16, paragraph 35. For I pray continually for them by day, and mine eyes water my pillow by night because of them. And I cry unto my God in faith, and I know that He will hear my cry, 2 Nephi 15, paragraph 1. Curse, Cursing Condemnation by God Damned To cease progressing or to regress. Damnation merely means the end of progress. So when one fails to progress in understanding, he voluntarily damns himself. When God offers a blessing or knowledge to a man, and he refuses to receive it, he will be damned. If mankind is to be saved, it will be through their acquisition of knowledge. Put otherwise, it is stupidity that damns them. It is knowledge which saves man. Damnation means hedging up the way so that one cannot progress. Day A varying increment of time used to specify the completion of a distinct work. The work of the creation is generally referred to as a day. There is no reason to believe that calling it a day in the language that gets employed in Scripture has reference to anything other than a discrete event. It would be more accurate to say that there were labors that were performed during the incremental progression of the creation which took however long, and when the labor was completed then that labor was called a day. There is nothing to suggest that the labor of the first day was exactly the same amount of time as the labor of the second day, nor is there anything to suggest that the labor of the third day was equal in time to either the first or the second, and so on. How many eons of time were required in order for God, through the process that we see in nature, to form the earth, that was the first day. However long it took, through seismic, volcanic, and other activities to cause the dry land to appear, was labor that took however long it took. Deacon in its earliest form, meeting informally for worship, small groups were led by both men and women called diáconos, a word that is translated into English as either deacon or deaconess. That Greek word means servant. It was in these home meetings where original Christians worshipped and learned of Christ and Christianity. Deny the Holy Ghost If your spirit has become sanctified, and you have received the presence of both the Father and the Son such that you, as Joseph described it, stand in the noonday sun in your understanding, then you have received the Holy Spirit of promise. This means that your own spirit reflects the promise of eternal life. You are then a spirit of promise, assured of eternal life. 
Then denying the Holy Ghost, as Joseph described it, involves taking what has become sacred within you and polluting it with deliberate rejection of the God you have received and who now dwells within you. Destroy In the vernacular of the Book of Mormon, to destroy did not mean annihilation. It merely meant to end the organized existence of a people or to terminate their government, deprive them of a land, and end their cultural dominance. In the Book of Mormon, a people were destroyed when they lost control over their government and land. Their ability to preserve their own values and choose the way they were governed was taken over by others. Most often it was from a different ethnic group, though not always. Once people were destroyed, they were oppressed and suffered. Often they were oppressed with grievous taxes and had religious liberties removed. Then they faced a choice, either repent, in which case they came through the period of oppression with another chance. Or if they were angry and rebellious, they would then be swept away. Being destroyed is not at all the same as being swept away. It is possible for people to have been destroyed and not even realize it. But when they are swept away, they face extinction and cannot help but notice it. Disciple The word disciple is derived from discipline. A disciple follows the master. Dispensation The beginning and ending of a gospel epoch or order. Dispensations have their bounds. Beforehand, the prophets give, through prophecy, a limit on the things that are to come. When the prophesied events have unfolded and the measure has been met, then one dispensation comes to an end while another opens. It is in the order of heavenly things that God should always send a new dispensation into the world when men have apostatized from the truth and lost the priesthood. Every dispensation of the gospel is the last dispensation, until it fails. Then another is sent, and it is the last, until it fails. This will continue for so long as man continues to fail. When a dispensation of the gospel is conferred on mankind through a dispensation head, like Enoch, Moses, Joseph Smith, then those who live in that dispensation are obligated to honor the ordinances laid down through the dispensation head by the Lord. For so long as the ordinances remain unchanged, the ordinances are effective. When however, the ordinances are changed without the Lord's approval, the critical question, they are broken. At that point, the cure is for the Lord to bestow a new dispensation in which a new covenant is made available. The Lord sends ministers with a commission to transition from one dispensation of the gospel to another. A new dispensation occurs when some lost or never completed components of the work need to be dispensed to mankind, either anew or for the first time. In Abraham we have an example of an isolated, faithful individual who honored the fathers and was doing everything that he could in his day but for whom there was no existing possibility for having it occur. God was able to fix that problem for that individual, not in order to establish a new dispensation in which salvation proceeds with the gathering of a people and a making of a people. But it was a dispensation to that individual for purposes of trying to call others to repentance. When God gives a man a dispensation from heaven, there is a labor to be done in his vineyard. The authority to complete the labor is implicit with the assignment given by God. When someone receives a dispensation and discharges the assignment with honor, he holds the keys, owns the rights, enjoys the honors, and possesses the dispensation of that assignment to all eternity. A new dispensation is founded on knowledge from those who went before who all declare their dispensations, their rights, their keys, their honors, their majesty and glory, and the powers of their priesthood, giving line upon line, precept upon precept, endowing them with knowledge, even here a little and there a little to the new dispensation. TNC 157, paragraph 31. Though this could be interpreted to suggest that every assignment from the Lord could be a dispensation, the broader statement clarifies that there is one dispensation supported, in turn, by many assignments. Man may have received power and authority to complete the labor assigned, and the inspiration from God to complete the assignment may have been provided to them, but that alone does not constitute a dispensation. For example, Nephi was sent to retrieve the plates of brass, but that was not a dispensation. It was an assignment, a request from the Lord. Many assignments are needed to fulfill a dispensation. All who complete an assignment with honor hold the keys of that work. 
but a dispensation is better understood as restoring and making overall progression of the covenants, promises, and prophecies to advance and vindicate God's work to reclaim the world from apostasy. Dispensation of the Fullness of Time The current time is called the Dispensation of the Fullness of Time because this time is leading to that return to fullness. However, in one sense, Joseph Smith was much like the Protestant fathers who laid groundwork for a greater, further return of light. They did not see the full return. This generation might. Disputation The Lord's elaboration on disputations and contentions in 3 Nephi 5, paragraphs 8-9 is important and consistent enough that it should all be considered together. First, he clarifies that baptism must be done as he commanded you. Deviations are not permitted and should not be asked for or entertained. That is the thing about ordinances. When given, they are to be kept in exactly the manner they come from him. When man changes them, they risk breaking the covenant between him and themselves, see Isaiah 7, paragraph 1. The Book of Mormon is silent about the disputations which existed among them over baptism. However, when Christ says there has hitherto been disputes, it is evident they existed. It becomes apparent from later passages that one practice which caused some of the argument was the issue of baptizing infants. There were likely others, as well. The Lord wants that to end. Perform the ordinances as He sets them out, and stop arguing about the manner. The reason arguments arise is because men stop gathering light by righteous behavior. When they lose light, they cease to understand the truth. They stray from the correct practice of the ordinance because they are unable to understand its importance. They see no reason to continue the ordinance in one form when another seems to work just as well. The result is a change to the ordinance. It is ever the same. By the time the change is made, the ones making it are unaware of any importance associated with the ordinance they changed. They discard what they view as meaningless. It would require a good deal more light and truth for them to understand the importance of what was given them. But that light and truth has passed away from them because of their conduct. Into the darkness the devil enters with arguments over the ordinances, why do it that way? It really doesn't mean anything. It is arcane and outdated. It doesn't really matter as long as you still have faith in Christ. That particular lie is very effective because it allows the person to presume they have faith when in fact they haven't the faith sufficient to obey Christ. People will get more out of the changes if we make them. People will have greater peace of mind if we baptize their infants. We'll save more souls, because by baptizing them when they're infants, we include everyone who would die before getting baptized. Our numbers will increase. We'll look more successful by getting more followers by adding their numbers into the group. What we change isn't important, anyway. If it were important, we would know that, and since it doesn't seem important to us, it must, in fact, not be important. Those who rebel at change are not really faithful. This shows inspiration. It's faith affirming. Change is proof that God is still leading us. And other such arguments and persuasions from our adversary. On the other hand, Christ is saying to keep the ordinances unchanged. And further, don't even begin to dispute them. They are off limits for argument, dispute, and discussion. When you open the opportunity to dispute over the ordinances, you are allowing the devil an opportunity to influence the discussion and change the ordinances. Disputes lead to contention, contention leads to anger, and anger is the devil's tool. So don't start down that road. Accept and understand the ordinances. If you are perplexed by them, then let those who understand speak, exhort, expound, and teach concerning them. As they do, you will come into the unity of faith and become one. Perplexity cannot exist when there is light and truth. Light and truth comes from understanding the ordinances, not changing them. So do not begin the process through dispute. The purpose of discussion is not to dispute, which leads to contention, which leads to anger. When the gospel and its ordinances turn into something angry and contentious, then the spirit has fled and souls are lost. It is the devil's objective to prevent you from practicing the ordinances in the correct manner. But, more importantly, it is his objective to prevent you from becoming one. 
when he uses arguments over ordinances to cause disunity, he is playing with two tools at the same time. First, changing the ordinances brings about cursings, and second, encouraging contention and anger grieves the spirit and prevents the saints from becoming one. The devil knows this, even if men do not. Men are urged to take steps they presume have little effect, all the while being lied to by the enemy of their souls. When men arrive at the point they are angry in their hearts with one another, they are not united by love as they are intended to be. These are the end results of the two paths. One leading to love and joy, and the other to anger and wrath, Helaman 2, paragraph 25 and TNC 69, paragraph 7. See also the glossary entry, Contention.